Gloucestershire City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. The future of privacy means don't use Facebook if you want privacy. Um, I forgot earlier to make sure your phones are turned off talking about phones so we, we uh, don't disturb the speaker. Okay, the main speaker today, I'm sure you all know uh, from his previous visits, Jonathan Finch, uh, is a keen ornithologist and he's returning to give a talk on bird life of Thailand, the strictly feathered variety. So any of you uh, uh, bachelors who are thinking it was a different type of variety of bird, you'll have to bear with us because it's the feathered type. Uh, Jonathan's previously spoke to the club in June last year about his novel of how to avoid madness in Patia or not. And in August 2017, surprising Patia. Jonathan, an author, teacher and lecturer, has published almost a dozen books in the last few years, including prize-winning poems. So without further ado, I know Jonathan is eager to get started. Uh, Please welcome Jonathan Finch. Have you got a suitcase as well? Oh, okay. Hello. Okay, so the things you need really when you're going bird watching or bird spotting are a good pair of binoculars and you need a good field guide to the birds of Thailand or to the birds of Southeast Asia. And I brought along I brought along my birds of Thailand just to show everybody. This is a book you sort of I put between my legs and lift the binoculars up. This one is birds of Southeast Asia. If you go further afield, places like Cambodia, the Philippines, anywhere you like. These are essential. But one thing, obviously, that an ornithologist has to have is a good pair of binoculars. And so I brought along, I brought along these binoculars just to show you. They're very heavy. And really, a recommended, these are 20 by 50, recommended version is something in the, in the region of uh, 20 times 30, something like that. Now, the problem with binoculars that are so heavy is that when you're in the field, they're obviously going to weigh on your neck. And then you're looking up a lot of the time because lots of birds go into trees. And so it's your neck that becomes a major problem. Now, I'm very enthusiastic about bird watching. And so I was going to scan the audience to see if I could see any birds. Now, if I, if I, if I scan the audience, I can't see any birds now because I was going to make a joke about Wren. But unfortunately, Wren and his associate went out, so I can't see a wren. Now, the wren is the second smallest British bird, yeah? What's the smallest British bird? Hummingbirds are not seen in, in Britain. Hummingbird is a, an American bird. The smallest British bird is a gold crest. Now, although you may think I'm showing off here, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that my mind is full of a lot of what I think is useful information, but what many people would think is useless information. There's the wren. 
It's just flown in. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you for coming back, Ren. But the main, the main thing is about birds is that you do tend to get your mind filled with lots of information, such as the gold crest being the smallest British bird, hummingbirds being seen in America. And there are the equivalent of hummingbirds here. And I'll give you the birds that people mistake for hummingbirds, and I'll actually mention them in the talk that's coming up. But this idea of acquiring lots and lots of knowledge through this hobby um, is something that I thought I could actually explore in this talk, in the sense that I started bird watching when I was six or seven. And it's a mystery to me. Everybody says it's in your bones, or it's in your DNA, or it's in your genes, but nobody in the family was bird watching except me. And so I thought, I thought to myself, well, how did this happen? And I can't really say it was maybe a love of nature. It was to do with the fact that I felt lonely as a child. It was probably out in Greenwich Park, that's a park in London, looking at squirrels, magpies, jays, and things like that. But it obviously had a, a huge influence on me because in my writing, the birds are always cropping up. And when I came to Thailand, because this is about spotting birds in and around Patia, I, I didn't quite know what sort of a treat I was in for. Why, why is Thailand, and even a built-up city like Patia, so good for birds? Sorry? Nesting, um, maybe, but it's to do with things like, I think, water and habitat and changes in seasons. And do the insects in Thailand irritate anybody? Now, what do birds like to eat? Well, some birds really do like to eat insects. And this country is full of them. It's full of all sorts of things which birds like. And it's also connected to the mainland. It's not a dreadful island, like the British Isles Islands. Or it's not even like New Zealand, which has a poor bird population. Australia, which forms or farms, whatever the word is, its wildlife doesn't compete, doesn't compete with Thailand. Cambodia, down the way, where the birds are easy to see or easier, also doesn't seem to compete. Thailand has a huge number of birds, and you can see them in many, many places. Where are the places around Pattaya that you can see birds? Well, I've listed a few of the places. There's Jongtian. There's Siam Country Club Golf Course. There's the Phoenix Golf Club. There's Bang Pra Reservoir, as you go towards Bangkok. It's 40 kilometers from Pattaya. You take a turning on the left. Bang Pra is in Sirachar. There's Mat Prachan Reservoir, just up the road from Siam Country Club. There's the Road to Sirikit Hospital, so you can do some bird watching while you're on your way. Um, there's Bang Sereni, of course, before there. And then there are lots of other places. And one of my favorites, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is Nakhon Sawan. Then there's Khao Yai National Park, which is past Cabinbury. But if you do a bomb, you can get to it in three hours. So you leave Patia at 3 a.m. and you get to the entrance of uh, Khao Yai National Park at 6 a.m., which is when it opens. And it's important to get into national parks before everybody else does, because there are more birds around. If you're thinking about those marvellous mountains, which are the Cardamom Mountains in Cambodia, if you go to Khao Soi Dao Wildlife Sanctuary near Chantaburi, another three-hour trip, you come into marvellous birdland. In Cambodia, there are places like Boca Mountain, or the road to Kep, which is going then Kep, beyond Kep, you go into Vietnam. And those are places where you can see birds, and lots of them. 
But what I'd like to do now is to get onto a hobby horse of mine. And a hobby horse really is basically why bird populations and animal populations around the world are in incline or decline. Are things getting better for wildlife or worse? Much worse. Because in, I've been in, in Thailand since, well, I bought my condo in Jongtian, that's in Soi Changapuk, and it's Banswan Malana, which some people will know. I bought that condo in 2006 and left it in 2012. And when I go back there, there are condos everywhere in Jongtian. Uh, the supply is there. Is the demand there? Absolutely not, because they don't get lit up at night. So what you're finding is that development has actually, not I wouldn't say decimated, but it's changed the habitat. And when you change habitats, you get rid of wildlife, willy-nilly. It doesn't matter whether you think the birds and the animals will, will relocate. If somebody gives you a kick up the backside and tells you and your wife to leave your house, you may be able to continue to live, but something's changed, like breeding. You might not want to breed so much in your new place. And that's actually what's happening. So there are concrete ways of destroying wildlife, and one of them is getting jaunty and full of condos, which are not used. There are incredible things, though, going on elsewhere. I was on a trip to Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai, and I just stopped in Nakhon Sawan. And I was with my partner, who at that time wasn't fed up with me, so she would go bird watching with me. And we got outside Nakhon Sawan, and we started bird watching, and there were marvellous wetlands. And I managed to see things like pied kingfishers and pheasant-tailed jacanas. Now, the imaginative among you, when you think of a bird like a pheasant-tailed jacana, it's got a marvellous ring to it, hasn't it? It's going to be a bird with a long tail like a pheasant's, and then you've got this lovely jacana, and it's a water bird, and it's a beautiful bird, and they were nesting there. We went up to Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai, and when I came back, I said to Na, I said, well, can we actually go to the wetlands again and see the jacanas? And we got there, and there were lorries everywhere. They were turning the wetlands into a water park. And the lorries were driving through. So my last view of these two jacanas was they were circling and crying pitifully. And that was it. There were no tied kingfishers, and the lorries were trundling through. How else do you not see birds? I'll come on to the personal matters that everybody is looking at mobile phones, or nobody's aware of anything flying by them, or you have to be sort of have a sixth, sixth sense about birds. But let's just take Boca Mountain. Boca Mountain is in Cambodia, and it's a national heritage property. And the climbers go in, and they take a plant which makes a type of broth or porridge. And they really do go in, and, and the guards don't do anything, and it's now free, so it's going to be even worse. And what you do when you change a forest floor is you stop certain rodents feeding. It's not easy, and then obviously the trees, the roots get less strong. And so you do find over time, especially if these sorts of activities are continuous, and they are on Boca Mountain, you'll find fewer rodents. And that means the birds of prey aren't going to be feeding so well, or aren't going to be feeding. So it's all a big chain or a cycle. And on Boca Mountain, and this is my hobby horse, it's protected, but it's not. So if you protect, if you protect something, you have to do it. And I'll come on to why Thailand is much better. Thailand is much better because the military protects its national parks. And by protect, I mean you can't go in and take lots of things from the parks. 
But on Oka Mountain, you can, whereas on Kalyar National Park, you can't. So these are some of the ways of diminishing or not seeing birds. And unfortunately, um, a lot of my talk was briefly mentioned in conversations around the table. Um, there was a conversation today about the Chinese taking over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, they're not taking over so much in Thailand because of the laws protecting property. But in Cambodia, Cambodia has sold itself to the Chinese which means that on Boca Mountain on the top, and not just the casino, I'm not just talking about the casino, there's lots of development, there are lots of cars going up, and there are going to be lots of problems in the future for the flora and fauna on Boca Mountain. But what about Sihanoukville? Sihanoukville is now unrecognizable. The Chinese have brought in everything. They're selling their own produce, not kind of produce. They're building on the beach. The Pai Hall bills are no longer there, and the Chinese are taking over. Outside Sihanoukville is Ri National Park, and the Kaimas have opened a military airport there. And that's a disaster. That means the birds cannot survive, and indeed they aren't. Um, six years back I saw flamebacks there, but they've now concreted a whole stretch there. Okay, so those are some ways of not seeing birds. But I'm pleased to say that Thailand does have a certain diversity. We don't, in this country, they, they don't go around cutting everything down, mono farming, putting up meat hedges. There's still a lot of wasteland, and that wasteland will still produce its bird life. Well, I hope I'm not boring you by just going through a little, a little bit more on the autobi autobiographical side. I think it should have come across now in, in this talk that I'm actually, for reasons which I still can't fathom myself, I'm pretty passionate about birds. Well, one of the things that I find amazing is the way in which birds are so difficult to identify, the way in which you go into a place and you don't know what to expect. So like fishing, there's the unexpected. You can wait for the float to go down. You can wait for a tree to fill up. And when it does, it's lovely. But there's a challenge as well. There's the challenge of not just your aching neck because you've got a heavy pair of binoculars. The challenge of seeing a bird and trying to identify it within a few seconds or minutes. So there are lots of challenges in bird watching, but I think essentially it's a, it's a lonely hobby. And so, was it in my blood? Well, I, I don't know. But many years ago, I had a starling, and I decided that I was going to help the starling to live. And my father came along, I was eight years old, and my father said, ha, ha, ha. And I said, why, Dad? And he said, I'm going to call the starling codswallop. Do you know what codswallop means? It means a load of rubbish, doesn't it? And so I had a bird called Codswallop, and I fed it for a week, and then it died. So I was sad, and I actually cried about this bird. But my father laughed, and my sister and my mother were concerned. So I buried the little starling, which they told me I'd killed by overfeeding, and I put up a little plaque, here lies a little bird. He lived a short time. Then, later on, I went to France, and I'd never seen a yaffle. A yaffle is a green woodpecker. And part of the reason why it's called yaffle is because it goes, yeah, ha, 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 ha. that sort of sound as it's flying, especially as it's flying. I'd never seen one. And we had friends, and we went up to a country house with um, counts or girls or part of the aristocracy. And my father was chatting about politics. He was a very political man and he was chatting to the owner of the chateau and his son, his son actually came along with a dead woodpecker, a dead green woodpecker and I'd never seen a woodpecker and he'd shot it from one of the trees and he said look at its tongue because this is a bird that feeds on lots of ants and the little guy pulled out the tongue and I wanted to hit him 
But of course, my father poo-pooed the whole thing and said it's just a bird. So somehow or other, birds were already traumatizing me through my relationship with my father, it would seem. So apart from all these lonely wanderings in Greenwich Park, Codswallop and the Green Woodpecker, and my father's indifference, he later became a green politician and did go out bird watching. So maybe there was a recessive gene in the blood. But for all this time, I got no support. And so in a sense, bird watching uh, reinforced my loneliness and certain events reinforced my loneliness. But here's the loveliest story of all. Recently, we're on Cyan Country Club Road and I am going swimming and I see a rat swimming with me. And I think, is that a rat or is it a bat? Okay, it's in the water. And I go closer and it happens to be a knock cow. <laughs> it happens to be a little peaceful dove. Now I'm going to show you images of peaceful doves soon. The peaceful dove is so peaceful, it's the bird that you usually run over. It's so peaceful it never gets out of the way of anything. And this bird in the water was a peaceful dove, so I fished it out, I put it on the side, it wouldn't go away, and so I took it home and I looked after it for three days, buying food and everything. My partner said, can you get rid of the bird, it's going to the toilet everywhere. And so, when the house was empty, I opened the cage, the bird was very strong, it flew from its cage onto a roof about 30 metres away, and then I noticed almost immediately a bird of prey flying in the opposite direction, and all the pigeons around the house, houses, were sitting on the roof, which is a sure sign that something had happened. So, even in my old age, when I look after birds, tragedy strikes, I think the peaceful dove just got, got caught by a hawk, because there are certain birds of prey around that area of my place, which is the dark side of Jogtio. Because some people know I'm a writer, obviously I wrote about birds, and one of the first birds I wrote about was a diver, and this got into Bird Life, which is an ornithological magazine. And I can just quote the first two lines. A diver rides the running wave astride the tide of distant lands. And I thought it was okay, but of course it isn't okay, because a stride is something you'd use about people, not about birds. But it was obvious that even at 16 or 17, birds were sort of in the blood. Can I now, if, if you haven't fallen asleep, can I ask for the first slide? Is that okay? Now I'm going to go through the, the birds that everybody has seen, but they haven't seen. And the reason why you see these birds is because they're everywhere in your travels, but you just don't take notice. The police will tell you not to look at your mobile phones, and I think bird watching is a marvellous antidote to that contemporary malaise which is always head down looking at phones. I'm putting it more seriously than the cartoon of the people in paradise. But basically the idea is there that we're not bothered anymore with seeing what's around us. What is this life if full of care? We cannot just stand and stare. What I'm trying to say is, it's a good idea to lift your eyes up. This bird is very colourful, it's one of my favourites, it's always near water. It's in Jontia, but it's especially in Bangsaray, and it's a coppersmith barbet. And it comes from a family of barbets, which are birds which are never seen, never seen in uh, Europe. And it's a lovely little bird, and you can see it perched on telegraph wires, the tops of trees, always near water and even near coastal uh, waters. Next slide please. These are all birds you can see in and around Patina. Next slide. Now this is a bird which people can see in Europe as well, especially in hot countries like France and Italy. This is the common hoopoe. And you'll again see that bird um, 
in and around Pattaya. It often goes onto the ground. It will sometimes fly up. And it has these amazing colours of pink and black and white. And when it's flying, it's especially lavish. Now, you've seen the two birds so far, the cockstiff barbette and the hoopoe. So how do you start to identify birds? You, you've got your bird book, you've, you're out in the field. What are the things that you would be looking for if you're going to identify birds? Could, could you just go back to the Copper Smith Barbette, the one before? Yeah, there it is. And can you tell me what, what sort of things you're going to be looking out for when you're bird watching? Because this is another challenge, isn't it? It's, it's not just seeing the birds, being able to identify them, but, it, but it's actually taking in what you're seeing. Any ideas of how to I of course, it's appearances, it's the colours. That's the first thing that's very indicative of what sort of bird you're looking at. Well, the beak. The beak as well, if you can see it, because it's not that easy. The beak. <coughs> you look at the habitat, where it is. You look at its behaviour and what it's doing. You look at its size, which is also to do with appearance and you start to come to conclusions. There are some unmistakable things, such as the hoopoe often has... Can we go to the second one? <laughs> the hoopoe often has its crest raised, as that hoopoe does. And, as Ren said, the beak, what it's doing... Sorry? The song. The song, yeah. If the bird is singing, you often hear a song and you don't see the bird. But it's a way of identifying the bird. Can we go to the next one? Uh, this is another one. This is a very strange bird, really, because it's extremely colourful, but I chose this image from Google precisely because the colours are not so evident. This is an Indian roller. This is an Indian roller. and. It has this absolutely marvellous blue when it flies, but it can, uh, Thailand is a bit strange. The, the light is difficult. The light sometimes doesn't highlight the colours, or the sun gets in your eyes, or even shadows of trees. But this is an Indian roller, beautiful bird, especially in flight. It sits on telegraph poles. It can be seen on Sukhumvit itself, going down towards Bangsarae. It's in all the golf courses. It will fly up and away. And the thing, the thing is about this bird is that it has a, it has a particular interest for me because I, I saw it a lot behind Banswan Lalana on the marshland there. And I always thought it was an Asian fairy bluebird. And I put the Asian fairy bluebird in the slides for later because when you're identifying birds, you make mistakes and big ones. So for years I thought the Indian roller was a nation fairy bluebird because of the blue. But there are differences not just in the colour of the blue, but also in where you tend to see the Asian fairy bluebird. Next slide, please. Yeah, it's, a, it's, not, it's not me, it's Google. It's Google. This is a bird that goes, oh, oh, oh. And people think it's a banshee, they think it's a, a strange spirit. And as Ren was talking about the peaceful dove and the Thai name for the peaceful dove, the Asian coal is called that precisely because of its song, Koal Koal. And it really does sing day and night. And it, it's establishing territory, it's just, it likes singing, it's a very, very noisy bird. So that's another way, it's not just the song. It's the amount of song that, that, that a bird gets through that would help you to identify it. And this, this is the male. Some people think that birds, male and female, are the same. Well, some of them are. But many of them are different, just as the juveniles are different. And so that's another challenge with bird watching. What are you looking at? A male, a female, a juvenile, a post-juvenile. But this is a male coal, and uh, the eye is very striking as well. OK, 
Can you go on to the next one as well? Do you see a great similarity in these birds? Can you go back? So, in a certain sense, when you're looking at these images, you're already a bit confused about what you might be looking at, but they are different species, they're different birds of the same species. And how would you know a greater, this is the lesser, Google, how would you know a greater from a lesser? Can you go, can you? <laughs> Tom, Tom. Sure, sure you saw this thing. Size of the tail. Yes, there's something to do with the size of the tail. It's also to do with things like the colour of the eye, the size of the beak. You can see the eye is definitely different. But can you can you tell me, even with the most powerful set of binoculars, with a bird moving or a secretive bird, and the greater Google is secretive, the lesser is less secretive, how on earth are you going to distinguish? You haven't got the two to make the comparison, are you really that good on size? So again, there, there are many challenges in bird watching. The principal one is, will, will you see a bird and will it stay long enough for you to identify it? But then there are all these other uh, problems that, that cause you to have to have a good, a good look. Next. Now I put this guy in because I'm sure I saw it, but I may be wrong. I mean, I've seen this in other parts of Thailand, but I'm sure I saw it in Jongtia. And this is a chestnut-headed bee-eater. Now, there are only, there are, in Europe, there, I believe there's only one or two bee types of bee-eaters. In Thailand, there are about seven, and they're marvellous birds. But, but, you know, you also know that birds are certainly aggressive when they're feeding. This, Beater will take take its insect and it will actually rub it along the telegraph wire. And that means the insect dies of burns, friction. And there are many other instances, just like the peaceful dove that got eaten by the bird of prey. The animal kingdom is by no means pacific. It's actually an aggressive. Uh, I'm going to get you if I can. And the chestnut-headed beater is no exception. But I've put it there because many of you, if you haven't seen this guy on your travels around Patea, you will have seen a bee-eater with a forked tail, because they usually have forks coming out of their tail. And that will be the one you've, you've seen. I haven't put it up there because, I, as I said, I'm still convinced I saw the chestnut-headed bee-eater. Next slide. Okay, this is our peaceful dove, not cow. And it's eaten a lot in the sand. It, it walks up to rifles and traps. It goes under car wheels, and it really is peaceful. It's not a marvelous photo. You usually see these guys by swimming pools or walking under, walking in roads early in the morning. Um, and it's got a lovely name, Peaceful Duck, but unfortunately, it's a bit too peaceful. Next bird. Okay, another very noisy bird like the Asian coal. You can hear these birds crying at night on the dark side. They're everywhere. It's the red wattled lapwing. And this is, a, this is a bird which is easily disturbed and is very, very noisy. I don't quite know what it's protecting with its noise, whether it's just protecting its bit of territory. But it's a very noisy lapwing, very beautiful. You can see it on the golf courses as well. It likes to be near. Okay, you can see it on. Well, you can't see this one. <laughs> yeah, you can actually. But you can see them on golf courses and everywhere, the red wattle and lapwing. Now this is actually a kite. <coughs> and what would the kite's name be? Because when, when birds are being named by ornithologists, 
They're given particular names for various reasons. What would this uh, bird be called? No? What about the shoulders? Can you take black? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a black-shouldered. It's more simple than these things. It's a black-shouldered kite because of its black shoulders. This, again, used to be seen a lot in Jontium. It's not that rare in other places, and it's a nice bird to see. Well, now we come on to some interesting birds. Can you go on to the next one, please, as well? Okay, so what bird is this? Many people will recognize this bird from uh, their own countries. This is the what? It's a fish-eating bird. Again, that's an indication of where it will be, near, very near water. It's a what? Yeah, it's a cormorant. Yeah. And there are two, two main cormorants in this part of the world. There's the Indian cormorant and the little cormorant. Can we go back again? Okay. Now that one, I've had to write it down is an Indian cormorant. And the next one? If you can see, the neck is slightly different. That's a little cormorant, but they're both the same size. And then the next one? This is a bird that's sort of black and brown. It doesn't look brown, it looks blue, but when it flies up, it's black, white, and brown, especially brown and white. And it's a Javan pond heron. And it can be easily confused with other birds, but again, it's a bird that frequents all the ponds and the pools of Jontio, Patia, and everywhere else. Now this guy has actually got a, sort of a, a backward crest on it, and this is a little egret. And the next one, that's a cattle egret. And a cattle egret will be seen sitting on cattle. But they're all of the same family, near water, near cattle, out in the pastures. Next one. Okay, so once the John Teal bird population diminished, the Asian open bill, and this photo shows the open bill, but it just, in general, they don't open their bills like that. The Asian open bill came in. When you're on, in the car coming from the airport or going to it, near Bangkok, you'll see lots of these guys flying across like little prehistoric monsters or Jurassic Park birds because their heads fall down a bit and the beak falls down and, and it, it's a, an impressive bird, it's large, it's black and white and it has this open bill. Next one. This is a brown shrike, again common in and around Patia, sits on telegraph wires and will the behaviour, of course, is similar to flycatchers. It comes off its perch and it traps insects in its bill. And it's not that difficult to see at all. Uh, around the lake, Mampajan, there are lots of them as well. So that's the brown shrike. There's, one, one, there's only one sort of crow you're going to see in and around Patia, and I believe even in Thailand, and it's going to be the large-billed crow. And it's very noisy, of course, and I'm glad that this photograph shows too, because birds also can be monogamous, unlike a patio hunter. <laughs> basically, you've got certain birds that you usually see with the husband or wife, and crows are usually seen in pairs, and I'll, I'll come on to other monogamous birds, and some birds that never remarry, that's why it's pretty important not to shoot birds, because you might shoot the wrong one, and it will be single for the rest of its life. So that's the large-billed crow, the black drongo. It's got a lovely name, drongo. It's seen swooping, it's even seen late in the evening, migrating back to its roost, and it flies in a very characteristic way, pretty high up in the sky, and that's a black drongo. And this is the greater racket tail drongo. This is the greater racket tail drongo. I can see that Ren is moving fast. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Thank you. So this is a marvellous bird because its tail is longer than its body. 
Can you imagine if you saw a human being with a tail longer than its body? You'd be very surprised, and this is the greater racket tail drongo. There is a lesser racket tail drongo as well, and the lesser racket tail drongo has a shorter tail. Then there are lots of other drongos, and they're very impressive because they eat insects. And this is an ashy wood swallow. The ashy wood swallows are everywhere, in Jonti and all over Thailand. And it doesn't look like a swallow, but it's called an ashy wood swallow, and it's grey. And it flies in that characteristic way, picking up insects. It's gregarious, which is another way you can establish what bird you're looking at, if they're in big groups of the same variety. It's gregarious. What about the pied fountain? Have you got rubbish bins where you live? Just look out for this bird. Birds tend, some birds anyway, tend to like rubbish. And the pied fantail, because it fans its tail and is black and white, likes to root in rubbish bins. And in Jongtian, in Banswan Lalana, when I went behind the buildings, there it was, in the rubbish bins. Okay. Now, this is a white rumped sharma. And again, you can see it on the road out to Surrogate Hospital in Bangsaray and in lots of other places. Next one. The big singer, the Oriental Magpie Robin. That one will sing a lot and you can usually see it. So if you have a bird which has a variety of songs near your house, it's going to be the Oriental Magpie Robin. What bird is that? Most people should know the family. Well, it's a starling. There are lots of different starlings around. And in fact, I believe, I haven't verified this, starlings are right on the decline, just as house sparrows are in developed countries like Great Britain. But starlings here, happily, I'm happy to say, are all around. And this would be a white-shouldered starling. Just as the black-shouldered kite, this is called a white-shouldered. And this is an Asian pied starling. Uh, it's pied black and white and Asian pied. The next one is the miner. And the miners are very, very interesting because they're very intelligent birds. They're not just survivors, they're everywhere. The common miner, it would actually imitate songs. And it, you, you can see its intelligence by the way it behaves when you're approaching it in a car. The peaceful dove looks at the car and doesn't get out of the way. This guy does. Next one. Okay, this is a white vented miner, it's got white, white vents on it, and it's again another very intelligent bird, part of the miner birds. Does anybody know Soy Aruno Tai at all? Aruno Tai? There's a restaurant as you come off Sukhumvit on the left. It used to have a hill miner there. And the hill miner would attack you if you went near the cage, and it would also imitate what you want, what you said. So this is how intelligent or imitative these birds are. Birds do have intelligence, in my opinion, of a certain sort. What about the barn swallow? This is a barn swallow because of the forked tail and because of the very red breast and throat. And the red rump swallow, next one, has got a red rump. And these are swallows, they're all over the place. The bulbs. Okay, this is a sooty-headed bulbul. And the under rump is red, but it can also be yellow. And these are everywhere. They're big singers and they're beautiful birds. This is a black crested bulbul, and I threw it in because I like this family of birds because they're very beautiful. And the red whiskered, the red whiskered on the, the Sukhumvit Road, there's the big garden park, I can't remember what it's called on the left, going towards Bangsaray. Um, yeah, the one that wins awards. I saw this guy there, so I put it in. Another very noisy bird is the common tailor bird. Then you've got the Indo-Chinese bushlark, and then you've got our very own hummingbirds. Now these hummingbirds are called flower peckers and sunbirds. This is it's the olive backed or olive bill. No, olive backed sunbird. Okay, that's an olive back. And the other one, going back, was the scarlet back flower pecker. And people mistake them for hummingbirds, but of course hummingbirds fly 
backwards and forwards than are seen in the Americas. These are seen here, they're always near flowers and trees and they're very small and uh, they are very similar to uh, hummingbirds. This is a paddy field pipit, uh, pipit and you can see it in all the fields. Then you've got the Eura Eurasian tree sparrow and last but not least on these birds is the white crumb munia. Now have any of you ever bought birds in cages and released them for good luck? They do, it in, yeah, they do it in the north and we think they're sparrows but they're usually munias and the reason they are is because the guys catch them and they can catch a lot of them together because they're a bird that is gregarious and goes in flocks. Can we now go on to the next one? Now, is that a mistake or not? It's a talk on birds, isn't it? But it's there because it's the giant black squirrel and you're going to be able to see these animals when you're bird watching. You're going to be able to see various animals like wild elephants, I saw a crocodile recently, and this guy was above my head and it's very impressive. It will eat birds' eggs, it will even eat birds, and it's in Khao Yai National Park. So don't forget the animals, which are an addition. This is a flame back, and it's one of my favourite birds. And then next, these are great hornbills. They're marvellous birds. I think they're very intelligent. They're very inquisitive, and they're also childlike in the sense their behaviour. They look through their legs at you, they look under branches at you. It's a marvellous bird. These are my favourites. This is a Brahmini kite and can be seen in near tract in Thailand. And the white-bellied sea eagle, a very impressive bird because of the large wings. The wreathed hornbill, I'm glad there's water because you always see birds near water. These are remarkable birds and they just make your trip very worthwhile. And they are here in Thailand. This is the golden fronted leaf bird, and it's a leaf bird because it lives in trees, you can't see it usually. And the green is very, very, uh, makes it very inconspicuous, so it can be feeding for minutes before you actually catch sight of it. This is a tame or a trapped Asian fairy blue bird, and it, it should, if people can remember, make you think of an Indian roller, but it's nothing like it, but when it flies, and quickly, the blue is what you see and you can mistake the Indian roller for this guy. And this is a laughing thrush, it's a white crested laughing thrush and it laughs in the sense that it's an extremely noisy bird. Thank you very much. Philippines, but it, it is very likely that 
now you come to now you come to mention it, I didn't see many. It may be because of the geographical setup of the Philippines, the islands, but there are definitely birds. Um, but I didn't see many when I was there, which makes me think that you've got a point. I could check it in my bird book, but I think time's running out. I do have a comment. There might have been a gentleman that was talking about the distinctive sound that comes out in the evening. It's actually a toke gecko. It's very loud, and uh, I saw, I heard that when we were in Champion, and it's a toke gecko, which is the largest species of gecko, but it makes a very distinct sound around sunset time, which almost sounds, you kind of have to swear, it almost sounds like, look me, look me, and it's a toke gecko, if that's what you're thinking of, around the evening, sunset time, and it's quite distinctive. On your left again, please. On your left again, please. Up there. <laughs> okay. I, I live in Jontian, along Jontian Second Road. And I used to have a, a website, a wildlife website. I went out at 6 30 every morning and photographed the, the wildlife I saw along there, be it birds, lizards, or whatever. Um, about five years and stopped doing it because there was no wildlife left. There was actually zilch there now. I can walk along there and there's nothing. There are pigeons because motors stop and throw food out the window. Pigeons come down and eat the food. But apart from that, I don't see any wildlife at all on John Tien Second Road. Nothing. Yeah, John Tien Second Road is correct, but I can say that Ban Swan Lalana still has some birds behind, but not as many as before. I, 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 to just come back to the gentleman who was talking about the gecko, I always hear geckos going, fucker, 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 okay. which, is, which is different from goal, goal, and different from go, 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 go. Over here, your man. <coughs> Thank you. I have noticed, or maybe they are around, but I haven't seen any seagulls here. Could you tell me why there's no seagulls here? I mean, in Australia, we could send you millions. Yeah, I've, I've often thought about that. Um, I don't know. I think that, that there are people who see seabirds by going out further from the shore. But where I've actually seen the talk type of birds you're talking about is Phuket. When I've been out fishing, there have been huge varieties of birds fishing with me and diving into the water after shoals of tuna. But you're perfectly right. When you go onto the coast, you expect to see gulls and you don't see them. Yeah. And I can't explain why, except that maybe the sea is too dirty or I don't know. I have a question. Um, England uh, normally has quite a big population, but I've noticed they've taken off a lot of the hedgerows. Has that affected the bird life? Well, again, for certain, yes. I mean, the, the topic is incredible. For example, Essex, before the Second World War, had natural hedges. And they tell me, the ornithologists I was friends with, tell me there was huge bird life. But when you get environments being made the same or actually diminishing, especially hedgerows, it would affect birds like yellowhammers and buntings. But the thing that I see in England is I see kites, magpies, and crows. I don't see starlings and sparrows. And sparrows are birds which were very high in my childhood. So I think these things are, are changing matters dramatically. It's the ornithological societies of Britain that contain yeah. these things because they do surveys. But I'm, I'm convinced these things have changed uh, the type of birds you see in the UK rapidly. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, sir. We're just running, running out of time. So. Thank you. Certificates of appreciation uh, for your wonderful talk on bird life. Yes, come down here. Maybe I've got a reason why there's no seagulls. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I think the sea is rather polluted and there's no fish for them to eat. That could be a reason. Anyway, thank you very much, Jonathan. Please give a round of applause.